Hello, hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It, coming to you from Lehman College. I'm Franny. And I am your co-host, Destiny. We have a musical genius joining us today. He has won Emmys and an BMI Television Award for his score from the Kennedys, a Cable Ace Award nomination for his score for the man who loved sharks, and a BMI Television Music Award for the Chicago International Film Festival Gold Plaque Award for his score for the LBJ. Our guest and his brother have also created their own sound called For So Loco, which is folk, rock, soul, and country inspired. He is also an associate professor of music at Lehman College. Our guest also has a bachelor degree bachelor's degree of, sci- uh, of science in music from Lehman College, where he studied um, composition and orchestration with John Corgiolano. He also is a factory advisor to Lehman College Audio Club. Our amazing guest band, the Bacon Brothers, is about to drop a new album on April 19th, this year, called The Ballad of the Bacon Brothers. Let's give a warm welcome to the mastermind of music, Mr. Michael Bacon. Thank you, guys. Very happy to be with you tonight. Thank well, you for that lovely introduction. Oh, well, thank you. You're such a, such a busy man. It's an honor and a uh, pleasure to uh, have you here for on our well. show today. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of you guys, the Bacon Brothers. Uh, one of my favorite uh, songs that I play on repeat is The Memory of You When I Cared. I love that song. <laughs> Memory of When I Cared. Yeah, yeah, I know that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Out of all your songs, you remember that one? That's fantastic because it's my favorite. Well, we've had uh, 11 <laughs> records, 12 records out, and this I think it's going to be our 13th. So, Wow. Wow. Um, for whatever it's worth, there's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of music we put out together, and which was, was great. You know, it was great and to share this band with my brother. And, um, you know, for most people and families, as you guys probably know, once you get older, you sort of drift apart because you got kids and grandchildren, and, and uh, you get together on Thanksgiving. But uh, we find ourselves in um, Oklahoma in a, in a rented car driving through mm-hmm. the desert for six hours. So it's, 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 we have a lot of... It's closeness kinds of experiences, which are, is really nice. Well, it's good unusual. that you guys get yeah. along. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't say we got along, but <laughs> <laughs> it's well, great to create those experiences as well. Yeah, they're unforgettable, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't know it's been it's been a great experience. And one of the things I love most about it is when you play in a band and you play all over the country, you go to places you never would have gone. In a normal thing. I mean, you're going to go to Chicago, you're going to go to Florida, you're going to go to L.A. and San Francisco. And we go to these tiny little towns in the middle of nowhere. And the, our, our single from this next record is called The Battle of the Brothers. And it's about a place we play in Texas, which is the oldest dance hall in Texas. They started in 1880. And um, I just fell in love with the place. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, you know, it's, it's a madhouse. But um, I felt like here are these two brothers from Philadelphia who end up in this crazy town from Texas, and it's just unusual. That's why I wrote the song. Um, I, wow. <laughs> I was actually listening to Battle of the Brothers on the way here, and I was fascinated. It sounded like it started off poetic, and it was a bit poetry. Can you talk about it a little bit about that? Well, it's kind of a cla- – first of all, it's, it's, I guess you would call it a talking blues song, mm. and it's there have been a lot of models, the, the Faust story, which means you sell your soul – to the devil in order to get something back for yourself. So the, um, the story is these two nerdy brothers from Philadelphia who don't know anything about music mm. just take a road trip together to try to get their lives together. And they end up in this little town in Texas where the, where the oldest dance hall is. And somehow they end up being uh, rock and roll stars and jumping on the stage. And eventually uh, all of the ghosts of Texas music... Uh, join in and the whole club rises off the ground into the sky and when it comes down the crowd is all happy but the brothers are nowhere to be found wow so, <laughs> i don't know what happened to them <laughs> <laughs> wow that's intense um, yeah, yeah it is intense. <laughs> i'm excited for the album even more um 
uh, follow up with your your touring. You said that you love finding all those little places, um, those unique places in small towns. How do you go about uh, planning out your your tour? Well, the way it works is we have an agency and a management, and um, the agency gets offers for for gigs, and um, they kind of schedule a run. And um, we try to go out. We're kind of weekend warriors mostly, mostly during the summer. So we're out Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then you have a, uh, the band, which is all of us. We're five of us all together. And then you have a tour manager, stage manager, and somebody sells merch, which is a big part of touring because you make a lot of money selling merch. And you sort of have a captive audience because they just paid a lot of money to see you play. They'll probably, you know, go for a CD or a T-shirt or something like that, too. So that's kind of the way it works. And uh, pinpointing, the, you just tell them we, you, want, you want the small venues and they just go from there? No, no, I them? want Madison Square Garden. But, uh, <laughs> it's not no, so much like what the, we the want. Texas, the, the, the Texas uh Well, what happens is your band hall. gets to a certain level and then if you, if you go to a bunch of 500-seat halls and you sell them out, then they'll move you up to mm -hmm. a 700-seat hall. But if you go to 700-seat hall and you don't sell it out, you're going to move back down wherever your the, the water level is okay. based on what you can fill yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's all it's all i mean uh if you're a promoter and you have a club you gotta have uh you gotta have all the seats filled you're not gonna make right. enough money to you know keep it going okay um thank you for that. Uh, so what is the most fascinating thing about doing music for a living because it's the most fascinating thing <laughs> it just is it's it's um you know i in my students at, at Lehman College, I've been here since 2011, and um, what I care about most, and all of my students are music lovers, some of them are going to be in music, some of them don't play instruments, but they still love music, is how do, you, how do I give you all the tools so that when you leave Lehman College and you're out there, um, the phone rings, and there might be any one of six people on the other end. It could be someone that needs... Uh, live sound reinforcement it could be somebody to engineer a podcast. It could be somebody, a, a film composer that got behind and needs help um, moving the film scores and getting them done, getting rid of the orchestrators. Uh, it could be um, disc jockey. It mm -hmm. could be any one of a lot of things. So um, I want I want to make sure I w I try to make sure that when that phone rings and somebody's on the other line my former student can go, yes, and in their mind they're going, sort of, but they still <laughs> say yes, mm -hmm. and then you stay up for three nights in a row and figure out where you don't know about it, but you that you got a job. And yeah. that's how I started moving forward in, with com incomplete information and working really hard to, to uh, try to fit into whatever the, the market of people making music, and that's where I've been really lucky. I've done a lot of different things. Thank you for sharing. That's sure. amazing. Thank you. We'll be right back after this short break with more Michael Bacon and his musical journey. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. For victims of drunk and drug driving, your grief is unique, but you are not alone. You always have a place at MAD. Call the 24-hour victim helpline at 877-MAD-HELP or visit mad.org. And now back to more at Let's Talk About It here on Bronx Journal Radio from Lehman College. Michael, thank you again so much for joining us. My pleasure. Your extensive composition resume, ranging from television, cable, and film, even landing you an Emmy, an outstanding achievement in music for the hit series Kennedy, is overwhelmingly impressive. So what would you say is your recipe for success? I'm glad you asked me that. And I actually really do have one, and this is another thing I tell my students. Um, talking about my upbringing, I was very lucky. I, I was rose, raised in a family that really um, uh, put the arts on a pedestal. Mm. If you wanted to be a dancer, if you wanted to be an actor, if you wanted to be a singer, if you wanted to be an artist, if you wanted to be a music person, that's all they cared about. And um, they didn't care about grades. Mm. So I often would bring back a uh, report card that spelt feed, and they would, <laughs> they would just sign it and, and mm. go on. But um, they really cared about the arts. And 
My father was an architect in, in our little row house in, in, in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The entire first floor was really one giant speaker. Wow. And this is FM mono and the sounds that I heard wafting up to my bedroom at night are still there. They're, and I have this source that I just got from my parents. And mm-hmm. whenever I need it, if someone says, well, I need you to write this piece of music, I just I turn it on like a speaker. It's there. I'm not saying it's great, but it's uh, the whole idea of, of, um, of uh, losing your ability to actually create stuff, um, writer's block, that sort of thing has never, never, ever happened to me. So anyway, going back to your question is, uh, since I started playing the cello when I was seven and I went to all the fretted instruments, guitars, basses, bandos, all that rock and roll stuff, then I played the oboe, um, but I was never taught any music theory whatsoever. Wow. So I kind of had to go through my musical life just using my ears and not the stuff that was written in books that I had to memorize. So when, I, when my students ask me, well, how do you do it? I say, well, the, here's, here's the key. Find out what it is that makes you different than everybody else in the world and get really good at that thing. Mm. So when I'm teaching, let's say, film scoring, um, if you use a computer and you're using a a keyboard to access samples. Yes. They can be really beautiful, mm-hmm. but everybody else in the world has them. Mm. Everybody has them all over the world. All you have to do is pay for it. So if I, if I um, put up a sample of a violin and I go, uh, it might sound really nice, but the person next door is going to have the exact same thing. As opposed to if you take a violin and you go, uh, that sound has never been played exactly that way in all the history of of uh, us. There's a rhythm to it. And is mm-hmm. never going to sound that that way again. And that mm-hmm. makes it unique. And so when I'm doing my sc- scores, I want to uh, put as many real instruments on it because wow. that makes what I'm doing unique. Whether you, people like it or not, it's, it's real. It's you. And so if you're... Um, I'm trying to think of... Let, let's say you're, um, you're an English major and... Um, you grew up somewhere and you never spoke English until you were 15 years old, for instance. I'm just coming off the top of my head. That makes you different than people, maybe bilingual people who spoke both languages their whole life right. and other people that didn't speak English until they are 15. That's going to make you different. It's going to set you apart. And it sounds like your parents didn't minimize your dreams, which is fascinating. Like you said, you may bring home a specific grade, but they were more interested on your passion yeah, and what you were passionate about. That's amazing. And I think you already spoke to this, but what are some tips you would give an aspiring writer or composer in one of your classes who doesn't know where to begin shopping demos to studios or record companies? Yeah, well, um, that's another um, uh, different part of the When I started in the music business and I made my first well, we were records, 12-inch vinyl record, uh, 1972, uh, where there was eight tracks, and it was on one-inch tape, eight separate tracks. Um, if you wanted to make a record and shop it, you really had to have a record company because in today's money, to make a 10-song, 12-song um, record would probably be, in today's money, $400,000. Wow. And wow. in those days, you couldn't do it the way it is done now. Now, all you need is a computer. Digitally, right. Mm-hmm. And a keyboard and mm-hmm. an interface and a mm-hmm. microphone. And a lot of records are going out there and selling a zillion dollars uh, copies. Um, so it's changed a lot. So the, the, the problem is you have, instead of um, six, seven, eight albums coming out a week, we have, I think I heard 10,000 songs come out a day like that so the marketplace is very very different than it was so um you have to access things like podcasts Mm -hmm. um uh youtube Mm -hmm. and um one of the great things about lehman studios which is right downstairs is we have state-of-the-art audio um recording and state-of-the-art video recording so my band the bacon brothers we've done many um recordings down there and we can film them too and then you can edit them together and put out and you have sort of a two two pronged approach because you have the song plus you have the studio version of the song 
Yes, I was able to peek in last week uh-huh. <laughs> to, to the production downstairs. It's really huge. It's big. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing. So we're we're lucky, and um, a lot of my students say, "Well, how do we get in there and do that?" And it's uh, I don't know what the rules are, but if it's attached to a class, that's what it's here. I mean, this is an educational institution, and if and if you are taking my class or somebody else's class, and you want to come in and try to use the studio, I think you should be able to. Right. Thank I, you. I can't wait to dabble in that studio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many ideas I want to create. <laughs> are you a musician, too? Um, n- no, I'm a writer. Huh. Yeah. What kind of things do you write? Um, I write uh, movie reviews and skits. Oh, God, that's great. So you're yeah. a critic. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm an, an entertaining, <laughs> an entertaining I happen to be a songwriter. You are a songwriter? I am a songwriter, and I've recorded music as well. So that's why that question was personal, <laughs> because I know it's it's gatekeeping, arguably, and a lot of people just don't know how to crack, you know, their opportunity. So it's more. I know it's more about who you know versus what you know, and also about your skill set, like you mentioned, yeah. and about your, um, your, your passion, so... Maybe we could talk about that a little Absol- bit more absolutely. offline. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I'm the, I started as a songwriter, and mm-hmm. uh, I still am a songwriter, and uh, I do a lot of other things as well. But, I mean, that's probably the hardest form of music to write. I mean, I wrote a cello concert. It's 25 minutes long. Writing a great song is harder. Wow. Well, you're doing exceptionally well. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk about it next. Um, live from Lehman College, you are on Let's Talk About It. We'll discuss what inspired Michael Bacon to become a professor at Lehman College amongst the 24 other CUNYs after this commercial break. Tonight's edition of Let's Talk About It, it is sponsored by ombau.org. A girl in Kenya dreams of becoming a doctor. An elder in Guatemala dreams of being part of a community. Reach out and change the world, and it will change your own. Onbound.org. And now, back to more of Let's Talk About It here on Bronze Journal Radio from Lehman College. Welcome back to Let's Talk About It, coming to you from Lehman College with our talented guest, Michael Bacon. Wow, that was... That was some inspirational stuff there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a lot from this uh, interview. So, again, thank you. Um, my question next is, what inspired you to want to become a teacher for Lehman College? Well, I was never inspired. In fact, I was running away <laughs> from it as, as quickly as possible. I'll tell you how the whole thing worked is <laughs> downstairs, and it's a little bit of a well-kept secret in this college, which is too bad. We have um, a video and audio and classroom, digital music classroom downstairs that cost in 19, 19, 2010 $16 million. Um, and Ooh. what it, when I came, I'll tell you why I came to Lehman in, in uh, the 90s, is I, I think I mentioned I always had a very good uh, musical um, playing, guitars, all the instruments, but nobody ever taught me any theory. And as I became a more successful film composer, all of a sudden these sort of oh, scary things, oh, I don't know how to do that. And ooh, uh, how do you do that? So I decided, I saw in the Musicians Magazine um, that John Corleano, um, who retired, I don't know, maybe four years ago, um, one of the most amazing people. Uh, first of all, he's a, if, you, if you mention the top ten living composers, you've got to put him in the top 10 in the whole world. Oh, wow. He's also a Academy Award winning film composer, uh, the score he wrote for the Red Violin, which is so incredible. And he also was nominated for Academy Award for a score uh, called Altered States in the 60s. So he's been around a long time, and he is, was, at that time, a full professor at Lehman College. And I saw in the Musicians Magazine, come to Lehman and study with John Corleano, Oh wow! Uh, and get then I would get my my BS, which I never had a degree before, and I jumped at the chance. And I was still a full time film composer, but I got to take private lessons with John, and also all of the other music tradif- traditional kind of music conservatory programs that I never had. And was the the more my composing sort of evolved, the more it was clear what I was missing. So I came here for those two years and. Nobody ever gets everything 
all that you need, but I got a lot of stuff that I really, really needed and gave me a lot more confidence. So, um, I, you know, I, I loved what I did here. And then um, sometimes there would be a fundraiser. Sometimes there would be a um, award ceremony and they would ask me to come back. And so I kind of kept in touch. And then when the, uh, when the multimedia center was starting to be built, um, a fellow that I had met here, um, Jerry Barnard, who was sort of the manager, asked me if I would come become a professor uh, teaching film scoring. And I said, absolutely not. I am not the <laughs> slightest bit. That is not where I thought that I'm, was going. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I'm an award-winning composer, and uh, I've got, uh, I, I'm trying to become a rock star. I mean, yeah. I, I, being a college professor is... It's so slow anyway, you down. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I did it, and I tried it, and the Two courses, three courses, really, I, I was able to make them up myself because at that time there really weren't any pro- programs in digital music technology. So I had a lot of freedom, and um, students seemed to be interested. And then uh, I was originally in a film intelligence study. Are you guys film intelligence studies? I am. Yeah, okay. Yes, my minor. Right, that's where I came. And right. then I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm in, I'm in music. Why don't I go to the music department? So eventually they put me in the music department, and... Um, I'm, I feel like I'm a, a, a link between the, the music department and the multimedia center and the film and t- television studies. And my passion is having people collaborate outside of their departments. Uh, one of the things I was really shocked about uh, academia was how much, if you're in this department, we don't want students from that. We don't want to be together. We want to keep everything separate. And I thought, well, does that make any sense? Uh, if you guys are making films and I'm teaching film scoring, wouldn't it be kind of good to come and work with one of my students and have one of my students work with you? And we have done it yes, over, the, over, over time, but not anywhere near enough. Not anywhere near enough. Right, right. I remember when I was applying for courses, I couldn't take the course for uh, film, fi- uh, music and film because it wasn't under media communications, so I got film and television, because I love soundtracks. I really feel like a a perfectly rap movie also tells the story through the soundtrack. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So now I can take that one semester. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Well, that's the kind of thing, um, you know, to me, if you're in an academic community, only staying in, in your department, I think narrows your horizons mm. and um i'm always trying to trying to go against that as much as possible and i'm the, the faculty advisor for the audio club which is my most favorite hour of the week and we have um, a beat battle planned with um osis college we're also going to try to do um college in brooklyn or queens so it's a cuny beat battle we've had one four years ago and now we're going to have another one and it's really exciting and we have celebrity Judges and these the teams have forty five minutes to come up with beats, and then they they come to the, and they show them to the live audience, and the judges get together actually in the podcast room downstairs and decide who's you know that's narrow them that's down. That's amazing. To, yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> that is get amazing. the competitive juices yeah, flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why it's called a battle. Yes, <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> Um, how, how do you balance your creative projects and teaching and personal life? Uh, there's no balance, no? but Good I will say, <laughs> I, w- I, w- I would say that, um, in terms of su- succeeding, if you don't have your family behind you, it's really hard. And that's my wife, Betsy. Your village. There, yes. Right? I see your beautiful wife. Hello, yeah. Betsy. And, uh, we've been, <laughs> she's been through it all these 52 years with me from Nashville to Pennsylvania to New York to the Bronx, wow. and uh, without that, you, you can't do it. Your your backbone in your village, exactly, you mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. And I have a follow up question to that. Sure. Um, what is the best part of working with family? Because I I did know that you work with your wife and also your brother. So I wanted to know if you have any stories of like maybe the ups and downs, the the pros and the cons. Yeah, let's see. Um, see if I can find any pros. I, <laughs> um, I think the the main thing is trust, and I think in something as crazy as the music business, that's really hard to find because you're working with people who are would be kind of out there, and they say, 
I'm going to do this for you. And uh, all of a sudden they don't. Whereas if you're with a family member and um, our son also works with the band um, and Kevin's son, Travis has produced three or four tracks for us. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So, yeah. So we are very much of a, a family organization and that you have this trust where you, you can start at a much higher level of communication because you don't have to worry. Well, well, I got to check this person out and see if they're mm-hmm. honest and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's, that's the main thing that's been great. And as I said before about being able to spend time with family and mm-hmm. that are, you know, you might not get a chance to because we're all busy. Okay, great. great. Okay, well, we have to take another short break because we need that uh, sponsor money. <laughs> so uh, we'll be right back with more Michael Bacon and a little Motown. Tonight's edition of Let's Talk About It is sponsored by Compassion International. Drought, war, and rising food prices have devastated families in poverty. $50 provides a food kit to feed a family for a month. Just text the word radio to 97646. And now back to more of Let's Talk About It here on Bronx Journal Radio from Lehman College. Michael, it's been so exciting to tap into some of your artistry, some of your expertise. You've curated programs here at Lehman. You have an audio club up and running where they battle for beats. It's, it's, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> um, but I do know that the Bacon Brothers, as we know it, grabbed inspiration from several music genres. And I was fascinated to learn Motown impacted some of your sound as well. Who were some of your Motown soul musical inspirations growing up? Oh, boy. Well, um, <laughs> Smokey Robinson, I think, just because I love his songwriting, mm-hmm. his voice is so strange. I mm-hmm. mean, he has a voice. Yeah, he has a, a, It's really a, an alto, mm. um, but that's all full voice. Um, I had a, one of the, I'll brag a little bit. I had a, <laughs> the only thing I ever wrote that, um, that, came close to being a hit was um by a group called uh the daz dazman and it it got up to like 30 on the r&b charts wow. and we were with the band and we were in um detroit and we went to the motown museum and uh they had all the you know the tops and the temptations and all that and they had a cd with the daz band with my song on it. Oh, and, wow. And that was, that was heaven for me. I felt really That's good about amazing. that. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure you were ecstatic. I was, still am. <laughs> um, Smokey Robinson is definitely um, iconic. Um, and, and, and in efforts to search for some of your social media handle, I found myself silently singing, Will the real Michael Bacon please stand up? <laughs> Do you have a social media? And what are your thoughts on social media and the evolution of these platforms, specifically for such an accredited and accomplished musician like yourself? Well, it's a lot of work. (laughs) Um, Like, for instance, I was talking about my nephew, Kevin's son, Travis, and he's got something on TikTok every day. And it's good and it's professional. And I don't have time to do that. I don't think I'm really good at it. I don't think I'm in the age bracket that I'm going to reach a lot of people. But the good thing is that our uh, Bacon Brothers management does a lot of that stuff. So nice. we're, we're okay in the, in the Bacon Brothers side, but my own stuff is, is pretty lacking. And I, I do see the necessity of, you know, you always got to be out there looking and putting yourself out. And I've, I've been... So thank you for the for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. We stumbled across um, Kevin, your brother Kevin's page with yeah, I, singing I to the to the animals. <laughs> How do you feel you. about that? I do you well, sing to the animals too on the farm? <laughs> when you get to the farm? <laughs> no, because then I would have to fi- first of all figure out what the latest pop song is, <laughs> and I'm just not going to know what that is. <laughs> Um, and my brother and his wife listen to music constantly. That's all they do. Music everywhere. Every room's got music. So they're really aware of the, um, the big hits. And I didn't even realize that Beyonce had a number one country record. You know, that's how aware <laughs> yeah. I am. And so Texas they take home. stuff like, yeah, they take <laughs> songs like that and they do them with guitars yeah, and ukuleles and the goats. Sound to it 
sang to his little cow that song. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah thanks to Fran. She shared the Instagram <laughs> profile on WhatsApp. <laughs> but good for them. I mean, it's been yeah. huge. They get millions of people watching that, and that really is the answer to social media. What can you do mm-hmm. that's going to – I mean, that helps both of their careers as actors and helps the band as musicians and – um uh, I admire that they're they found a really nice kind of kind of piece of that. That's really and it's not easy to do. Yes, and I wanted to backpedal a little bit. Thank and thank you again for saying that. You know, we reminded you to tap into it a little bit. Right. <laughs> um, but if we can backpedal, I did see an interview where you mentioned your sister taught you how to play the guitar, yeah. and then in turn you taught. Kevin and you're nine years older and I just think that that's fascinating the way you know you guys just pass the baton to one another you want to talk a little bit about that yeah well I go back to the crazy family I was brought up with (laughs) six kids in this I think the house was 15 feet wide and it went up four stories and we were just all packed in there and we all went to Philadelphia public schools which at that time the music program with that was amazing it just and it really breaks my heart when I look when I ask students, uh, anybody play any instruments in here? And they go, Yeah, I played the recorder in sixth grade. Wow. And then never and um what we had in Philadelphia was really, really amazing and we were very lucky to go through it. But in terms of our family, um my sister and I had a jug band, just to give you a little inkling, a jug band where the um twelve tone blues in the deep south was starting to evolve and going from individual performers like Robert Johnson going into bands. But um, these people in the Deep South, these singers, they're not going to go out and buy a trumpet because they're not going to be able to afford it. So they use a kazoo or a comb with uh, wax paper on it, and they're not going to go out and buy a a $5,000 stand-up bass. They have a wash tub and a broom handle and a cable and they can play it's called a jug band you just and harmonica and guitars that was about it um and there was really kind of the rage uh at that time and so my sister and i formed a jug band and um my, uh, kevin tells the story where he would sit on we would rehearse in the in the basement and he would sit on the top step and just listen to us rehearsing which i think Listening to people rehearse music is there's an enormous ability to learn a lot about music when you listen. Yeah, and fascinating. My, my mother is a very strict Victorian woman, and um, we would pour through these old jug band records, and a lot of the lyrics were a little dicey. And <laughs> so um, we would find a song we, we liked, and my sister would start singing it, and my mother would hear the song and say, no, <laughs> you are not singing that song. <laughs> So that was just part of the fun. But we had a great time, and um, and after that, I went to college and played in rock bands and knew that I had to go to music. And at that time, this is, you know, like uh, the hippies hadn't really taken over, and at that time, what the message was is do your own thing. Just don't care about anything else. Just do your own thing. If you like doing it, do it. I don't know if that's good advice or not, but I was luckily kind of caught in the wave of, of that cultural thinking yeah and i know the narrative also was the bacon brothers started from a one-off gig yeah <laughs> yeah sure yeah. yeah um because my brother was we had written a lot of songs together uh over the years um mostly kind of get rich quick schemes like um in the i guess the 70s there was a roller disco craze and we wrote a song called eight wheel boogie trying to you know, it was a disco song for a roller disco. And all of our, our efforts have failed. And um, when he started acting, we, we would write music for his films, and we never got anything in anything. Um, but um, where was, where was, what was the question in? I, I got yeah, the one-off gig. Oh, the one-off gig. Started, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, good. So <laughs> the dynamic was we did a lot of music together, wrote a lot of songs on a recording studio, but um, having been... A cultural icon he was reluctant to all of a sudden go in a band because then it would seem as if he's just it's a hobby and he's exploiting yeah that to, to make more money or whatever it was mm-hmm. which it definitely wasn't because we've been doing this our whole lives but mm-hmm. um an old friend of his from philadelphia um had heard some of our demos and said why don't you uh 
put together a band called the Bacon Brothers, come play one show in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I got a couple of side men that I'd known for years, and we did a rehearsal, and we went and did it, and it was better than anybody expected. <laughs> 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 and it just kind of went on from there. So definitely, that's a true story, for sure. Nice. Yeah, yeah I love that story. Um, well, Miss Michael, Mr. Michael Bacon, it has been an absolute pleasure meeting you in person. You are the true pillar of musicianship and longevity. Um, please take this time to plug any upcoming tours, albums, and projects. And lastly, tell us where we can find you to keep up with all this greatness, and then we'll transition into audience questions. Uh, well, we, April 13th, our new CD comes out, and they're releasing them slowly. Uh, I think we have three singles done. Um, if you want to hear my other gig, uh, I've written the music for um, Finding Your Roots, Henry Louis Gates for, wow. for 15 years. One of my favorite shows. And, yeah, and that's <laughs> still going. So that's my music in there. So if oh, you, nice. Um, yeah. And it's very different than being in the band, uh, writing songs. It's instrumental music in the background. I think that the things that mean most to me is every once in a while, not often, um, you'll write a song and somebody will, it'll affect them. Unfortunately, it usually comes from some kind of tragedy. For instance, I wrote a song called uh, Don't Lose Me Boy about having a son and growing up and going out in the world and, you know, but don't forget about me. Don't forget about us. And um, uh, people that have lost children, like, really identify with that song very deeply, and I think it's been therapeutic. And my brother wrote a song called uh, Angelina, and this, I've seen the same thing where people, it just kind of affects their life. And I think that's great because it's just a, it's a one-on-one, one-on-two kind of thing. It's not a major explosion, but I think those are the most rewarding things. Thank you so much. Sure. And remember to catch Mr. Michael Bacon, some of his music on Finding My Roots. Hey. <laughs> They're in the 10th season, right? I think uh, it's it season 10. 10. Or, well, I also did before that, I did African American Lives. Oh, and nice. And another one. So I've, it's re- literally been 15 years oh. th- that I've been working with, with Skip Gates. So that's been wow. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm actually a part of a band myself. Um, we're native in New York. Uh, we've done a few shows in, in the city. Uh, but I feel like one of the things that we struggle with the most is uh, finding time to get together. Um, what do you say when you feel like you're separated from like your brother and you, you want to write music? Like what is some kind of tricks that you've done to kind of like make that work? Yeah. Great question. Um, nowadays the necessity of sitting down in the same room with someone is less, but not entirely. Um, and in terms of my relationship with my brother in songwriting, when he first started, he didn't even play the guitar. So I had to really, kind of take his song he would sing them to me and I'd arrange them for him and now he doesn't need that plus he's pretty good in the studio too um but nothing uh tops sitting down in a room together and cranking out a song and our new single um uh I uh, can't think of what it's called right now but we wrote that with uh, this couple from Nashville and we just sat in the room together for five hours and cranked it out and um I think that's much more rewarding. It's kind of scary because you walk into a room with strangers and you're kind of laying out your soul in a way because if you're not laying out in, this, in, in a song, then what are you doing? Uh, but as far as getting together, um, I don't think the there's still a problem with Zoom and, and um, <laughs> what do they call it, um, delay, uh, so that it's... I don't know if you can really sit down and zoom and, and play music together yet. Right. But I can just I can just say you just gotta figure out a way to you know, get all your bodies in the same room at the same time. And and uh I don't, I think there's really no other way to do it. And of course playing live is the most important thing because that way you get to feel things that you thought the song was doing or the music was doing and the audience you can feel they're not getting that. Where they're getting yeah. something different. Yeah, I, I feel that a lot. Yeah, it's it's really important. That actually brings me to a second question. Do you prefer, like, the studio process, or do you prefer, prefer performing live in front of people? 
I think probably live because it's so it's spontaneous and it's over really quickly. Yeah. So <laughs> if you if you write a four minute song, it's going to be four minutes with that song, and yeah. not uh, four days trying to get that song to that point. Yeah. Um, but I think that those two things are really kind of melding together. And what I'm seeing in terms of the royalty stream of recording and record sales is unless you're at that very, very top level, your only way you're going to make money is by playing live. Yeah, oh, wow. uh, yeah, that's that's really where all the money, because all the money goes into the studio, and then you right. got to make your money back, and you said something about merchandising, especially. Yeah, absolutely. Half people coming out, like, that's when you really want to sell, so I, I really understand that a lot. Yeah, I, I, my brother and I put, we've invested a lot in the live show because people spend a lot of money to hear us, and... I would really be disappointed if people went away and said that was that was not a great show. And that's what we want to do is make a great show out yeah. of it. Um, and so far, we seem to be doing well. People are showing up. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Good luck with the band. Oh, thank you. Great luck. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, wow. This sounds so different. Okay. Um, so a lot of us are, you know, barely, well, just about to start, you know, going into our careers and all this um in this media, this communication, and it, these are very, like, artistic fields, and, you know, um, it, cause, it takes a lot of confidence to really put yourself out there with mm-hmm. these creative projects. So, like, where do you, um, when you were first starting out, get the confidence to really show off your work to, um, you know, potentially start a career in this? I didn't really have any confidence, and I had a, an old friend of mine um, who, how would I describe it, was not lacking in the humility and he um, he told me okay I'm forming this band you're going to be the guitar player and singer it's going to be a duet and this is what we're going to sing this is where we're going to sing it and I said okay why not so I think in terms of the confidence thing I guess I guess my point is that um, if you're shy which I really was mm-hmm. um, that's that that's behavior that it can be learned that's what I learned and now I, I just don't have, you can see, I, don't, I just don't have problems, you know, talking and being spontaneous in front of people when people are, you know. Um, tell me your question again. <laughs> it's just, um, finding the confidence. Too. Oh, finding the confidence, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's like anything, it's just kind of doing it. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll harken back to what I said about what is it about you that's different than everybody else. Mm. And if you really commit to that and get really good at that. That's your confidence is going. But I wouldn't expect it just to have, boom, you're going to have confidence. It's going to take a while. To, one of the things I'm really hoping that I, I don't feel I've done at Lehman is, is really working on the um, internships in real situations. And unfortunately, when, when we came to New York in the 80s, there were 10,000 music houses doing jingles. Now there's, if there's oh. five, I'd be, I'd be surprised. Wow. So, um, it's, 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 but the internships are, I think, a really wonderful way to try to break in and work your way up. And, and you, the Bacon Brothers, you also tell stories in between your sets, right? Much to the chagrin of our band members. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think, I mean, we try to just make it like we're sitting around a living room yeah. and uh, make it intimate. Yeah, intimate yeah. as much as possible. All right, we have uh, another question yeah. from Stuart. Um, is there a song that you wish you would have written? Oh, God, so many. <laughs> so many. Oh, God. I was just listening to a podcast about Gordon Lightfoot. Um, but I think the one song, if you had to pin me down to one song I, I wish I'd written, you may not know it, but it's called Where Have All the Flowers Gone? And it's written by Pete Seeker, who was one of my idols growing up. And it's going, the song is Where Have All the Flowers Gone? A young girl's picked them. Where have all the young girls gone? Went to young men, where have all the young men going to soldiers, where have all the soldiers gone? Going to graveyards, where have all the graveyards gone? Going to flowers. Mm. And it's one of those wow. songs that is going to exist long before the man that wrote it, Pete Seeger, um, uh, died and it's totally forgotten. It's just it's it's just gonna live forever. And I think that's that's a that's a you know, that's the kind of song I would like to I wish I'd written where have all the flowers gone, but I didn't. <laughs> Interesting title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful it. song. <laughs> mm-hmm. He wrote so many great songs. If I had a hammer, a way. Yeah, I mean, just a zillion. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, I just have a question. Since you've been in this field for so long, um, have you ever had an experience where uh, you fell on something and how did you manage to get back up? Like like something mm-hmm. that didn't work out the way that you expected it? Or because, like, you know, since we are all about to graduate um, and going into the world and getting our careers and everything, like sometimes we're scared of failing, of things not getting not being the way that we expected them to be. So I wonder, like, if you ever experienced something where um, your expectations versus the reality shock, and how did you manage, like, to continue? Because to this day, you have managed to be successful and do a lot of things with your life. So I just want to know what is an advice that you would give to us. Well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had some really, really good film scores or really, really good composers And as I talk to them, I realize they'll never be able to do it because they're they're not they don't want to take criticism. They feel like their music is art, and they don't really want to hear about. And I don't tell them that. I'm I'm not saying you're going to fail your whole life, but I can just tell them. Then the the, one thing I've been lucky is I'm a very collaborative person. Um, I and as a film composer, I describe it as a craft and not an art. The art is the actual film that comes out. But you're just one of those people that's trying to, you know, go into the mind of the director and try to figure out how the music is going to help the director reach their dream. So um, I think that, uh, especially in film music, you're you're uh, constantly being asked to revise stuff. So um, you write a piece and they say, okay, I don't know, try it a little different, do it a little different, and then it's take try uh, version six, and then it's version eight. And then as for version 10, you feel like you're just never going to get it. And sometimes you get fired. Happens to everybody. My, my, uh, my teacher, John Corleone, we're talking about, one of the greatest composers ever. Got, he did a whole score for a film that didn't even use it, just threw it out. Wow. The, sc- the score for 2001, A Space Odyssey, was written by, um, by uh, North. What's his first name? Uh, can't think of his first name now, but his last name's North. I mean, big time Hollywood film composer. And they took all his music out for 2001 and replaced it with orchestral music, you know, Strauss and all the ones that we're used to. Mm. Um, and that's devastating. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. devastating. Yeah. But I think if you have if you have family support, you can get through that. And I've um, I've never gotten so low that I just wanted to give up. And uh, you know, that's that's how we do it. Hello, Professor. Hi. Yeah, uh, my first question is, uh, what advice can you give to any young kids, like, who is inspired to, like, want to do music? Like, what inspiration, like, can you give to them? Like, what, like, what kind of challenge, like, do you want them to do? Like, make them be who they, ha- who they are. Well, I guess, I guess one of the things is you got to figure out if you're... Um, intuitively good at music and i mean there are you know i mean i do music i I can't understand how anybody wouldn't know how to do music because i it's not that hard to me but i would think that for a very young child exposing them um to some kind of an instrument and and i don't really i'm not crazy about suzuki where they're two-year-olds are doing that seems a little early but i think by seven or eight um if someone has a a um desire and is drawn to music to give them something to play um guitar is nice because you can sing with it um exposing them to the music that if you were the parent the music that you love and that's what my parents did to me they they loved opera ballet broadway shows world music jazz folk all this stuff and they put it put that in me Mm -hmm. and it was very easy for them to do it because that's that's what they did so um, I think I, I mentioned this, that it's very sad in terms of the public schools that I understand in New York are not doing much music at all. Yeah. And in Philadelphia, I mentioned it was crazy what, you know, the, the musical experience I had. Everybody got an instrument. Everybody got a teacher. Everybody got a, um, a little orchestra to play. And that started from fourth grade and went all the way through high school. And if you were particularly good, you would then go to the all Philadelphia elementary orchestra or the all Philadelphia junior high or senior high school. So it was, um, 
I, it must have been very expensive, but it was totally free to all the students. And wow. unfortunately, that's, I think that is just not in the cards anymore. No. But, I mean, I, I think that if, if you are interested in music and you have a child, they're going to they're gonna get that from you, just mm-hmm. the way I did from my parents. And my parents weren't good. They didn't play any instruments or anything. I mean, they, didn't, they just loved music. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that exposure, like, if I, had <clears throat> I can remember saying to my son, here's a song that I absolutely love, and listen to the song. You know, that to me would be how, I think that's kind of where your question is going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my last question is, um, do you have um, any musical influences that, like, you, you love to listen? Like, do you have anybody, like, you look up to you as a role model, like, like the, the first time, like when you started music, like who inspired you? Like, like, like I need to do this music that uh, that made me be who you are. So, uh, I, I wanted to know, like, do you have anybody like you like you see as a role model? Like anybody like you see as an influencer to you through music? Yeah, it, it changed a lot when I was first starting out. I was playing the cello which was kind of dreary because it's reading and you have lessons. And then when I learned how to play the banjo and the guitar, I had a lot of idols who were folk musicians. Um, wow. The f- first one, Mississippi John Hurt, who has the most wonderful guitar style <laughs> ever. A uh, little guy, and I would go to the Philadelphia Folk Festival, he would just walk around with his guitar and talk to people and play <laughs> and stuff like that. And he was certainly one. Then this guy, Pete Seeger, who wrote that song, Where Have All the Flowers Gone?, um, was a banjo player and I played the banjo and I wrote him a letter and um, I just said, you know, I, I love your music. You're great. And he literally wrote back a postcard to me. I'm oh, a little wow. kid. I don't even, <laughs> this is like God reaching down. Yeah. And <laughs> that really, just the fact that he did that and he sent me his banjo book and I had to send him $2 and 50 cents back. But um, I just, that was really inspirational. And then I think the other things were just my older sisters, uh, being able to play music in my family. Um, uh, of course, the British invasion was huge, uh, Beatles and Stones and all that stuff. And that's when I was in college. I was, mm-hmm. That's all we played in my, in my little cover band. <laughs> um, and then um, I think Joni Mitchell um, was one of the people that really made me look at the acoustic guitar is really what I'm an acoustic guitar player and James Taylor um Jim Croce Gordon Lightfoot I, I love singer songwriters and I really look up to them and then I also and I'm really um amazed by the uh I call them the legit players people who started playing the violin when they're four and they practice six hours a day and they're you know they're so accomplished on these instruments and put in 10 times the work that any pop musician or folk musician put in there's just the way it is mm. um, and if, if you're playing the guitar you don't have to play six hours a day to be able to play it as opposed to a violin or a cello or an oboe that's what it's going to take mm. so uh, yeah i admire classical musicians an awful lot great questions yeah absolutely <laughs> I think my takeaway is that we'll push these New York City public schools to implement more instruments. Anything I can do. <laughs> anything I can do. Art needs to make a huge comeback. You know, one thing I saw this film, one of the Academy Award nominees, and it's about these four people in L.A. that fix all the instruments for the L.A. public schools. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And I think that would be a really great thing for great Lehman incentive. To, to, to bring in a musical uh, instrument uh, technici- technology course. Yes. And maybe have a piano technology course with that because there are pianos everywhere and you yeah. g- somebody's got to tune them and fix them. Um, but that's one of my dreams, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Your dream will dream. come true. Yeah, this makes that dream happen. <laughs> So we we uh, thank you again, Mr. Michael Bacon, Professor Bacon, Michael, Fran, anything you want to say to wrap up? Um, no, just thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to, to meet you. It's the first time I meet a musician that I listen to <laughs> <laughs> in person and get to ask some questions. So thank you so I much. I also want to <laughs> thank Professor Castellano, Castellano for, yes. for bringing me in. We've been friends for a long time. It's like whenever a blackboard blows up. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's Thank you, Professor. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you so much. Let's talk about it live from Lehman College. <laughs>